Hello, dear participants. Welcome to another uh, guest um, lecture. This uh, afternoon, we have with us uh, Professor Laurence Poison Chazour. Warm welcome from um, myself and also from Nilofer and on behalf of the Academy, Laurence. Uh, we're very happy to have Professor Poisson Chazour to speak uh, to you today on our module on international environmental law, and she'll be speaking about international environmental law in time. Um, it's a, a great pleasure to have with us one of the great specialists of international environmental law, um, and uh, Professor Boisson Chazoun, she's professor uh, at the University of Geneva, and uh, she's director of the Masters on Disputes uh, Settlement. In Geneva, she's also a member of the Institut de Droit International, director of the International um, Hub for Water Law in Geneva. And she has uh, been uh, an arbitrator, counsel uh, for different states and, and, uh, and an expert uh, at the World Bank, the United Nations, uh, CV is, is uh, so long in terms of uh, areas of expertise and, and works that I will not steal time from the lecture to say everything, but just to say that, uh, uh, dear Laurence, you're very welcome. I'm sure that uh, our participants will benefit immensely from uh, um, your uh, presentation. And of course, as usual, we will leave time at the end for um, questions from the participants, whether um, in the chat or live. Um, so we're very eager to uh, hear from you, Laurence. You have the floor, please. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, thank you to Nilufer. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, and uh, it's um, it's it's on uh, online, but... Uh, we, I hope that I'll be able to exchange with the participants. So um, today I'm going to be speaking about international environmental law in times. And uh, I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to put. So I'm just going to need it. Yeah. Great. Um, so the, um, the the name uh, on the PowerPoint is not, I can't speak about international in its entirety. So it's international environmental law in times and in time. And uh, what I want to do with uh, you during uh, this uh, lecture is to speak about uh, the fact that time plays a particular role uh, in international environmental law, as well as in domestic law. Um, and this is uh, especially true because uh, the international environmental law is, of course, reacting to past events, but international law is required to project itself in the future. And in fact, uh, it's, there are not many bodies of norms and principles who have this hard task of projecting uh, uh, itself in in the future remember that uh, we have the notion of uh, intergenerational equity which uh, is an important feature that we need to think anticipate think about uh, the status of uh, uh, the future generations and and then there is also, as you know, this thing in international environmental law that uh, we need to prevent as much as we can uh, damages. Uh, we need to prevent damages to happen. And uh, uh, there is also this issue that uh, it's not preventing things that we know are going to happen, but it is also preventing uh, um, events, even if they are uncertain. So uh, uh, there is this need for what I've called anticipation. So need for anticipation, this is going to have some effect on the way international environmental law is going to be produced. And I'm going to be looking at uh, sort of what I've called the lawmaking uh, strategies for producing international environmental law. So uh, this requirement about anticipation is one of the important features. The other one is that um, because uh, there is uncertainty and because in international environmental law, we need to work 
at the universal level. It, there is a requirement that all states agree on certain basic uh, uh, norms and principles and instruments. Uh, and that means that um, we have to think in terms of processes and accretion in a way that it's never going to be uh, a one step. Uh, even if it's going to be building over the time, uh, the consolidation of a rule of law, which then might be endorsed in uh, in uh, in a treaty or become a, a rule of customary international law. So, time is going to be there. Also, we need also to focus on time in a way that uh, we need time to produce uh, and to establish a rule of international environmental law. And then. Uh, there is uh, this requirement in international environmental law, which is that uh, there is a need for evolution because uh, we learn new facts. We learn, and uh, with the scientific knowledge is uh, uh, in evolution. Um, I think that uh, no better than the Biodiversity Convention has told us, admitted that uh, we know very little about biodiversity, you know, about the uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the nature, the functioning of nature, and uh, that means that uh, we need to learn more. And when we learn more, uh, we need also to adjust the law in light of uh, new discoveries, new knowledge, new scientific knowledge. And uh, this evolution of facts, law, and scientific knowledge has uh, some repercussion about uh, the need for adjusting the rule of law in international environmental law. So the question that we're going to be discussing today is that which are the tools that can be resorted to for helping the law to be established but also to be evolving in light of uh, the needs for uh, new uh, the, that of the uh, of new facts and and a new discovery in terms of scientific knowledge so we're going to be looking at these tools so first of all of course uh, we have treaties okay and we know that uh, treaties play an important role in the field of international environmental law. Um, and uh, it's true that uh, there is, I think, less appetite for multilateral treaties. But this being said, it's quite interesting to note that in the field of international environmental law, uh, we've had a recent uh, treaty that has been uh, adopted and signed, the Treaty on the Biodiversity and the High Seas. And it's a major achievement, I think. And uh, currently in Geneva, I'm sitting in Geneva. In Geneva, there are discussions uh, about uh, the uh, uh, treaty dealing with the elimination of plastic. So that means that, yes, treaties, It's a, there is an agreement among states at the universal level that uh, they can play a role for establishing legal regimes that are going to be focusing on certain objects. That said, I think that we have to admit that uh, there are certain treaty-based techniques that are resorted to for, law for allowing uh, this, uh, the consensus to be built, but also for allowing treaty regimes to evolve. And um, so one first technique which is used um, quite uh, it's is it's the fact that we're going to be resorting states are going to be resorting to first framework conventions and very often you're going to see I've given the example of the UN FCC convention the convention against uh, on the uh, on climate change uh, where there was a need to establish a consensus among the states at the universal level in 1992. And, uh, and, uh, and this consensus was included in a framework convention. I think that the same happened with uh, the Biodiversity Convention. There was a need to establish a framework of understanding of what people were discussing about. And I suspect that with uh, the elimination of plastic, we're going also to have a, a framework convention. So what does it mean? A framework convention is that it's the first step, the first treaty step in a way that uh, um, the framework is going to be uh, uh, um, including broad commitments among parties, defining an objective, 
and defining also a system of governance with uh, different uh, organs, different bodies, which are going to have uh, specific uh, responsibilities. So we are, with framework convention states are establishing regimes that then are going to be developed. But these regimes allow the states to meet and discuss about a certain topic in the context of different bodies that that have been established by the framework convention so the framework convention is sort of establishing the pillars of institutional pillars and regulatory pillars that need to be further developed by other instruments and these other instruments are additional protocols and um, We've seen that uh, in in in, uh, in some of uh, for some of the framework conventions that, uh, for example, uh, in the field of climate change, we had the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, where for the first time states admitted, and it was for the developed countries to do that, that uh, they needed to reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases. So we had the first step with uh, the framework convention, and then. The Kyoto Protocol with targeted obligations for the northern countries, the developed countries, with respect to the decrease of emissions, but also for the providing of technical assistance and financial assistance. Now, this uh, the uh, Kyoto Protocol had a certain time duration. Uh, it was uh, uh, till uh, 2012, and and then there was uh, the need felt to to negotiate another treaty, which is the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement is not really subsequent to the Kyoto Protocol, but it's linked to the Framework Convention. Now, uh, what I find interesting, and it's also maybe something to be discussed among us, in that in the field of climate change. Uh, it seems to me that the Kyoto, both the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreements are also framework conventions in a way that they are frameworks, okay? Because in this area, it's quite difficult to agree on detailed obligations. And I think that the knowledge is not yet sufficient for establishing precise obligations. So um, we have uh, a set of different treaties um, and 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 the uh, the Kyoto Protocol or the Paris Agreement is developing the framework conventions, but both the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreements are still quite general in uh, their content. But think about the Biodiversity Convention. Uh, the Biodiversity Convention is inter it's interesting because you have three additional protocols and. Uh, uh, this additional protocol have allowed to break down uh, uh, the problem through different uh, axes. So one of them is the GMOs, genetically modified organism, uh, with the Cartagena protocol. But then you have the sharing of benefits uh, with the Nagoya uh, protocol. And then you also have a protocol on liability. So it's interesting to see that uh, there the strategy of the Kyoto of the protocols in the context of the biodiversity convention is to focus on certain issues and and to get more precise on specific issues linked to the framework convention which is the biodiversity uh, convention so as i've said it seems to me that uh, framework conventions are important treaty tools because they allow for states to agree on basic features, basic tenets, and then to develop further the regime they've agreed upon. And how they do, do they do that? Um, aside from protocols, states are resorting also to uh, uh, other types of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, treaty techniques and and those are the decisions of the conferences of the parties the conferences of the parties are established by the treaties by the framework conventions or or, or, or more precise treaties and um, and and the environmental treaties are living animals they are evolving and how do they evolve aside from the kyoto from the from the protocols they aside, they evolve through the adoption of decisions of the conference of the parties and uh, this is the secondary law and uh, it's interesting because uh, there've been a lot of writings on the legal status of decisions of the conferences of the parties I don't think that we are still clear about it, but we know about the impact 
of uh, these decisions of the of the conferences of the parties they play different diverse functions um they can um, complement uh, some provisions of the of the uh, of the treaties uh, they can uh, develop certain provisions and interestingly if you look at the kyoto protocol for example article 17 of the kyoto protocol but also look at the paris agreement you will see that some of the provisions of the kyoto protocol and the paris agreements are asking the conference of the parties to develop further certain notions so they've agreed that it's through secondary law that the law uh, should be developed. And in this context, uh, I think the parties agree that these decisions of the conference of the parties will have a mandatory effect. So it's an interesting uh, process for developing further the law. But when you think also about decisions of the conferences of the parties, even if they are not mandatory per se, they're going to be interpretative tools because they are going to refine. For example, I've been working a lot on fresh water recently, and it's interesting to see what the, um, uh, the, this, uh, the Conference of the Parties of the Biodiversity has said about aquatic uh, um, uh, ecosystems and the need to protect fresh water. So these decisions of the Conference of the Parties have interpreted further the notion of ecosystem, and especially in relation, for example, to freshwater, but also in relation to other issues. And then uh, decisions of the parties are going to be important because they, they can establish new procedures. For example, if we think about the non-compliance procedures, it's interesting to see that, uh, yes, they are provided for in the constitutive agreements in the framework conventions, but then there is a need to develop them further, and they, that is done through decision of the conferences of the parties, and in this context, I think that they also have a binding effect. So. Uh, that uh, is something that I wanted to uh, stress: is that convent treaties are living animals, and uh, and and the decision of the conference conferences of the parties are going to play a very important role for refining the content, for defining further what states understand under the uh, with the notions that they've in they've included in the in the framework conventions and the other treaties. Now we also have other techniques. Huh? And, uh, and they are the amendments and the annexes. And uh, uh, yes, you have that for other treaties, but it's interesting to see that uh, uh, amendments uh, play uh, an important role in the context of, uh, in, the, in the field of international environmental law. And why do they, why are states resorting to amendments? Because of the evolution of knowledge and the evolution also the accretion, the fact that there is more willingness to do something for dealing with an environmental topic. So uh, in certain fields, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the protocol of Montreal, we've had uh, uh, a, a certain number of ad amendments and in, in the Montreal Protocol um, we also had a special techniques in terms of amendment which, I, which were called uh, um, adjustments and adjustments they were based on the opting out meaning that they were binding automatically on all states except those who wanted to we want to go out. Amendments already, it's got, it's usually going to be based on the issue, on the on the technique of opting in. You need to agree up and, uh, on the amendment. But that said, I think it's an instrument which uh, has some value, but it, uh, it can only cover a specific issue uh, in a treaty. And this is why I think the technique of additional protocol protocols and the decision of the contracting parties are going to have their own life because they are more general in their scope for sort of making the treaties evolved. And then annexes. And annexes, it's interesting because, uh, yes, we have annexes in other treaties, but in the context of the international environmental law, it seems to me that they play a, a specific role. So... Um, they are part, they are an integral part of the treaty. So they have, they produce a binding effect, but uh, annexes, usually you see that uh, uh, they are called to, um, they, it is said that uh, they uh, they should refer, they, they should deal with technical issues. Now, <laughs> the big thing is what is a technical issue? 
and um, and look at the annexes of uh, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, and you will see that it's not just technical; it's also identifying the states which are going to have responsibilities. Um, and then, uh, even if it's technical, we said the identification of certain greenhouse gases, for example, uh, that means that when these greenhouse gases are identified, this is going to be broadening the scope of the obligations of states for uh, decreasing, mitigating the emissions of greenhouse gases. And uh, so, Annexes, I think the value added of annexes is that uh, they uh, can be amended through a simplified procedure and uh, it's going to be binding upon all the states. So there is no opting in, which is required, for example, with uh, amendment. And uh, it's a technique which uh, I think is interesting because it allows a treaty to evolve and to be accurate with uh, uh, the knowledge, the scientific knowledge, as we have it with respect to a certain issue of environmental law. And I put on the screen um, uh, an extract of, of an award which opposed Ireland to the United Kingdom in the context of a uh, uh, convention in the Northern Atlantic uh, dealing with fisheries. And it's uh, interesting to see that uh, there the tribunal said I've looked at all the treaty, including the annexes. And I think that this is something which is important. And quite often we forget to look at these instruments which are important for understanding the context and, and the overall uh, commitments uh, uh, which are binding upon the states. So as you see, uh, I've... Uh, put a lot of focus on, on the treaty techniques because I think that treaties are going to continue to play an important role in the field of international environmental law. And it seems to me that international environmental law has allowed us to see that we have at our at hands various treaty techniques which are of interest for us because they allow us to help the regime to evolve and to cope with new realities and new needs. Of course, treaties are not the only uh, is not the only source of international uh, law, and and we have customary international law. So, customary international law. This is uh, more known to you. So, uh, uh, because uh, we, this is a, an important feature of uh, international environmental law. I think that uh, principles, and it's not often sufficiently explored, but principles play diverse functions uh, uh, and uh, it's not just interpretation uh, we come to interpretation but uh, they orientate they guide uh, and they ensure coherence among different uh, uh, bodies of law and uh, so they are they're crucial for uh, the the good functioning of the environmental law system but with respect to evolution and what I've called international environmental law in time, um, I think that the interpretative function of principles has been very important for helping states to evolve, to get adjusted to new realities and new needs. And uh, uh, it's interesting to see that all judicial organs at the international level have not hesitated to use principles of international environmental law as tools for making treaties greener or make or modernizing treaties. So uh, uh, on the screen you have uh, the example of uh, uh, the Gapshikovo Najimaros project case. Um, this was in 1997, and there it was about a treaty negotiated, adopted in 1977, and the and the and the court, the International Court of Justice, said, but you know, um, today, 1997, you can't interpret the, the interpret the treaty as you were. You thought you could interpret it in in 1997 because, as you see in the extract, uh, the court said um, there are current standards which should be taken into account, and these current standards are the principles of international environmental law, 
which need to be taken into account when one speaks about the protection of the environment. Um, we have uh, also other extracts, just cases that you surely know, but um, I think that the Iron Mine Railway um, award is interesting because uh, um, it's a treaty which was negotiated, concluded in the in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it came at the forefront of a dispute between Belgium and the Netherlands at the end of the 20th century um, and beginning of the 21st century. And what was at stake was the fact that uh, Belgium wanted to reactivate the treaty. It was the uh, railroad um, uh, reactivation and and the uh, uh, and the and the and the Netherlands were saying it's not it's true that the treaty provides for this, but then now you have international environmental law, and there are a lot of measures of for, for protecting the environmental law in the environment that have to be taken into account. And the big discussions between the two countries were to say was but who should pay for these measures? So they went before a, a tribunal, and interestingly, this tribunal said something which. Uh, maybe it's also food for thought for us, it said, look, uh, it said almost any treaty has to be modernized, has to be made uh, greener. And even if a treaty didn't speak about the environment and was concluded in the 19th century, when this treaty is going to be implemented in the 21st century, it has to be to take into account the uh, rules of international environmental law and, and the, and the, the uh, tribunal referred explicitly to Article 31, Paragraph 3, Subparagraph C of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which says that uh, for as means of interpretation, any relevant rules of international applicable in the relations between the parties can be taken into account. And uh, so it was a big uh, entry for international environmental law. And you see, it made uh, this treaty evolved in light of in light of environmental needs, and uh, and that means that a lot of treaties that have been concluded in other times, uh, when environmental law was not yet a body of law, um, might uh, be dealt with in the same manner. Now another uh, example which. Uh, is also in relation to treaties concluded in a treaty concluded in the 19th century is the is um, it's uh, the decision of the court in, in one of the disputes which opposed Costa Rica to Nicaragua and and the court said um, we can't not speak about environmental protection it's a new concern and that has to find place in the legal uh, regime that is binding upon the two states so as you see for me and this uh, when I, i'm speaking of uh, of uh, law making strategies legislative strategies for sort of uh, allowing environmental law to be taken into account and for making treaties to evolve in principles of international environmental law are going to be playing a very important role we can say for example that they're like trojan horses okay they enter into a regime and they make they try to make this regime more environmental friendly so we've spoken of the two principal sources of international law treaties customer international law we are looking at these two sources through specific angles i'd like now to um, mention the role played by so-called soft law instruments. So um, soft law instruments, uh, unilateral acts, okay, of mostly of international uh, uh, of international organizations or so declarations adopted at the uh, at the end of a, of a con of a meeting uh, between parties. Um, they play a very important role for sort of nurturing a process, for allowing for the aggression to, to be built. Um, what we've seen, we've seen that a lot in the 90s and, uh, and the 2000s, that states, states would meet, they would agree on certain issues through soft law instruments, and these soft law instruments would be adopted like on a yearly basis or every two years, and they would allow to 
they would they would they would permit that uh, norm of customer international law emerge, and we see that with um, um, the, the the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, a lot of uh, these. Uh, the principles contained in the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development were not uh, part of the uh, were, were not were not yet in ninety two uh, principle of customer principles of customer international law, but they have uh, over the time with references to diverse instruments such as soft law instruments, they have acquired a status of customer international law. So, um, for me, soft law instruments. Uh, are very important for building consensus and, and allowing uh, for the uh, consolidation of uh, a norm of customary international law, but also soft law instruments can allow also for um, agreement on certain issues which are then going to be included in treaties. Now, preparing these lectures, I was uh, thinking of, um, of um, the right to water, and for example, because it's interesting to see that uh, the right to water for personal users, which I think is now part of customer international law, was really built over time through a process. Uh, and it was a reiteration of resolutions by the Council of Human Rights and the General Assembly of the United Nations. And they've allowed for this uh, uh, right to emancipate itself and to gain a legal status. And I think that's something which is important. And I hope, very much hope, that the same sort of, uh, um, that the same is going to happen with the right to a clean environment. I'm not so sure the clean the right to a clean environment is both uh, uh, recognized as such by the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council, uh, but it's a right which still needs some more political and legal support to be, I think, recognized as a, a, a full-fledged norm of customary international law. So. Aside from the principal sources of international law, the role of soft law instruments, and then standards and technical regulations. Standards and technical regulations. Um, there, what I want to say is that um, the law is not only produced through diplomatic uh, means, through diplomatic conferences, um, uh, with states represent state representatives meetings and deciding about what should be the law in the field of environment, uh, uh, as well as in the field of health protection, um, there is a need for having a certain technical and scientific knowledge. And, uh, not, uh, and, and so there is a need to rely on expert communities, expert communities which are going to have certain knowledge in certain areas. Um, and it's interesting that uh, you have... Um, uh, some uh, uh, some gatherings uh, which have understood that, and I'm thinking of the international standardization organizations where you have a mix of representative of states, but also experts uh, who play a role in the in in the elaboration of standards, um, and and they these uh, standards are going to have their own life because if you look carefully at uh, at uh, references to uh, uh, in documents soft law documents and treaty documents you're going to see references to these uh, standards and technical regulations as i said those standards and technical regulations are not adopted through the classical ways of doing the law, as we could say. Um, they are elaborated in the context of epistemic communities, which are agreeing on the best practices in a certain area. And uh, what I think is interesting is uh, that uh, you have some treaties which are referring explicitly to these uh, standards and technical regulations, and I'm only going to mention the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the WTO agreement on technical barriers to trade, uh, as well as the agreement on the sanit the WTO agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary measures, uh, which are referring to uh, 
a certain number number of uh, uh, expert communities, expert organizations, and 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 also allowing in the TBT saying there might be other technical standards, uh, technical regulations that we can refer to and which would uh, justify that a state takes a certain. Um, decision. And interestingly, in the Cartagena protocol on the genetically modified organisms, you also have a reference to the guidelines developed by international, international organizations uh, uh, in relation to the conduct of risk assessment. So that, I think, is also a means that we should keep in mind because uh, it allows the treaties to be to, to remain acquainted with the development of new knowledge and the and the development of expertise in certain areas and not but not least when you speak of standards and technical regulations uh, in case you're interested in corporate responsibility there is more and more a requirement that companies uh, behave in a certain way for protecting the environment and the human rights and in the in the area of investment protection, you see more and more investment treaties referring to all these corporate responsibility standards. So giving life to technical standards. So to conclude, um, what I'd like to say is that you have these various techniques, which uh, we have um, for making the law uh, um, evolving, uh, but, that can be, in this context, I think that we should acknowledge that uh, courts and tribunals are going to play an important role. And not just international courts uh, um, or international tribunals, but also domestic courts. Uh, because um, domestic courts uh, are also aware now, more and more aware of these international instruments uh, of different type, and they can use them. And uh, um, for example, uh, and you might have already discussed that in some of your classes, but uh, I would like to refer to the uh, a decision of the German Constitutional Court of twenty of uh, twenty twenty one on uh, on um, on the, uh, in relation to uh, to the to climate change and requiring the government to modify its legislation. And what did the Ger the German Constitutional Court do? It referred both to the Paris Agreement, but it also referred to the refer to the reports of the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, which is an expert body, and it said, "Look at what they say. You, we need to do more uh, for really uh, facing the challenge of uh, uh, climate change." So, and in this context, I think that domestic courts are. <laughs> in a way, they have more courage than international courts and tribunals. So there are interesting laboratories for saying what we can do for pushing uh, further the protection of the environment in the, in light of new knowledge and, uh, and new realities. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Basson Chazurn de Lawrence, for this um excellent overview of uh, international environmental law over time, but on different dimensions and different aspects, which uh, I think make a lot of sense also taking into account other um, models that uh, um, our participants have attended, including international lawmaking um, and how it all comes uh, together. Uh, but also in particular uh, the um, topic of this week, which is international environmental law and uh, anticipating also a little bit on the topic of next week, which will be climate uh, climate change. And uh, and so we see these intersections that are extremely interesting. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat and the Q&A and for the moment, I don't see any questions, but maybe I'll take the advantage just to break the ice and 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 actually ask a question, um, uh, which was coming to me as you were speaking, but has to do exactly where you stopped <laughs> about the role of international courts and tribunals, and of course you emphasize the role uh, of um, uh, domestic courts and sometimes being more bold, but of. Of course, at the moment, and our participants know this well, there are currently pending two advisory opinions, uh, one before ITLAW's 
uh, and the other one before um, the International Court of Justice that are related to uh, climate change. Um, and one, of course, uh, the laws one more in relation to UNCLOS and the other one, including, among other things, um, human rights. And so I was wondering if your um, analysis of international environmental law uh, over time and the different aspects that you focused, including evolutive interpretations that make uh, um, for um, or call for a, a, green, a greener interpretation of existing treaties like UNCLOS or human rights treaties, if you think there's room for this in the context of this current advisory opinions. And this is just while we wait for questions from our participants. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Um, it's, uh, I, I didn't participate to the um, advisory proceedings before it lost, but I read a lot of the uh, statements which were made. And it's interesting that uh, most of the statements were pushing, pushing the interpretation as much as they could for uh, making uh, climate change obligations, as you will study them next week, uh, enter into the field of uh, the law of the sea. Um, it's interesting uh, because I think that um, um, the, the ITLOS will have to take that into account. I'm not, I don't really know yet how it's going to take it into account. I'm not so sure that uh, it will be precise as some would like it to be. But uh, what is sure is that uh, the court is going, the, the ITLOS is going to help uh, um, the member states to understand that uh, there is a strong connexity between climate change and uh, and the law of the sea. And that when we speak about climate change, we speak about the entire Earth system and the seas are part of the Earth system. So uh, uh, there is a need to protect them as much uh, as possible. So there, it seems to me, but I've, you are a specialist about uh, advisory, uh, the uh, consultative functions, you're going to teach about it at the Hague Academy, but it seems to me that there the court um, and the tribunals have more leeway for uh, making the law uh, progressing a bit more in uh, in its content and, uh, and showing paths for evolution. So uh, it, it will surely... I think have a role uh, with respect to climate change. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you. I agree. Uh, of course, I agree. Um, and and it's true, as you said, uh, a lot of states that made uh, observations uh, before uh, the um, it laws, they were asking uh, the court to interpret um, and clause, also taking into account, for example, the Paris Agreement, uh, also with this. Uh, um uh, you know as 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 a part of evolutive uh, interpretation and taking into account developments that happen in the in the meantime so i'm i'm um, again monitoring please uh, if you want to raise your hand and ask a live question uh, please do so um I'm not sure. I know there's a problem with somebody uh, that disconnected. That's what I see in the chat. I think our participants are being a bit shy today. It might be also, I mean, and, and we it's appreciate. No, no, I, I think the there's also. A bit technical and that's. No, the... no, no. No, I think there's also there might be a reason and, and we do appreciate the participants flexibility is that we're not doing this in our normal time. We're doing it slightly later and so that yeah. might explain that uh, maybe there are other commitments so okay yes so we have uh, one one question from Ajema um, from Ethiopia um, can we how can we say uh, the Paris agreement is considered as a framework as long as it is binding on the parties to it yeah Okay, so that's thank you very much for this question because it allows me to go back to um, the notion of framework convention. The notion of framework convention uh, is uh, when I speak of, of a framework convention, I speak of a treaty. It's a treaty which is binding upon the states. 
But if you look, for example, at the, at the Climate Change Convention, the UNFCC of uh, uh, of 1992, you will see that it's it's very general, it's programmatic in its content, okay? And uh, But I think it's, it's very important that states reach this uh, stage of adopting this convention because they agreed on the fact that there was a need to do something in legal terms with respect to climate change. They also set an objective, okay? And, uh, and they also established the secretariat of the Climate Change Convention. They also established the, uh, the Conference of the Parties, subsidiary organs. And uh, so they, they put in place the pillars of action with respect to climate change. Now, some have said that in Article 4, uh, 2 of uh, the Convention, there was even an obligation to at least uh, decrease uh, a, certain, a certain amount to, to decrease the emissions but I'm not so sure of that and it was always contested by the by the US but anyhow not not many states reached this uh, target so I think that they did not really take it uh, very seriously but that said they had this legal framework so then came the willingness to do something to decrease the emissions, to mitigate the emissions. And that was done through another treaty, which is the Kyoto Protocol. Okay. Um, but then uh, the, the Kyoto Protocol reached it and it was prolonged. But at the, in, the May, in the same time, there was an agreement on the Paris Agreement uh, adopted in 2015. And you will discuss that further next week, if I well understood through Patricia. But all that is to say that we're speaking of treaties which are linked one to each other. What I was trying to say is that, uh, and maybe it's a, a bit of a, of a, it's that in the field of climate change, there is not yet a lot of easiness about what to do. We know that we need dramatic measures to be put in place, but it's very difficult to put them in place. And you will see that next week. And what I was saying is that when you look at the Kyoto Protocol or when you look at the, at the Paris Agreement, you still have this feeling that, uh, Yes, there is a bit more agreement than in 1992, but there is still a need to further and to strengthen uh, the commitments. So that's why I was saying that all these treaties in the field of climate change, they look a bit like framework conventions, but each of them are sort of more precise each time. Yeah. So, and, and, and I think that there are certain obligations arising from framework conventions, but no 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 mitigation obligations i'm afraid yeah thank you very much um so there is another question also in the chat uh, from gosego from botswana you mentioned linkages of environmental law with the law of the sea um what linkages have already been forged or are evolving um international human rights international trade law and what motivates these linkages so this is for professor <laughs> Calva tell us, huh? she made the <laughs> statement before the, the Law of the Sea Tribunal, and I would be happy to hear. Uh, but this thing is, uh, and I think that's what the environment is telling us, and you will see that with other professors, is that it's a transversal issue environment. And do, you don't have any boundaries for, for environment. It's the environment of the planet. It's the environment of, uh, of uh, us. And so that means that... Uh, we lawyers, we have this. Uh, we like to segment stuff, and we like to 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 have uh, to specialized treaties, specialized legislations, and so on. And uh, and what the requirement of the protection of the global environment is showing us is that there are interactions among the different components of the natural environment. And that means what? It means that if you speak of the high seas. They, uh, for example, we can speak of the acidification of the high seas because of climate change. So we need to do something in the field of climate change so that we can protect the high seas and you have, we protect the resources of the high seas. So for me, all these links are, are, are scientifically based, but legally we need still to strengthen them. And I would be happy to hear Professor Galvao about this issue. <laughs> 
No, I mean, I, I, I just would add one point. I mean, the law of the sea convention, and that was the question before the international tribunal on the law of the sea on the, on the advisory opinion. Uh, it has a part twelve on the protection and preservation of the marine environment, which is clearly, <laughs> um, an environmental issue. Um, and of course, Laurence, what you mentioned initially also about the BBNJ agreement, uh, the agreement to protect the areas uh, beyond the national jurisdiction, um, it is an implementing agreement or additional agreement to the Law of the Sea Convention, but it's very directed to areas that have to do with bio biodiversity and the environment. So. Um, and even, I mean, of course, it's not the topic today, the, the linkage between that it's mentioned in the question between human rights and trade law. Um, that's also very important. So we, we do look in, in the e-academy, we do have uh, the segmented approaches to the specialized fields of international law. But of course, there are many areas where they, they intersect. And, and, and I think what you said, Laurence, about... Uh, the need to green <laughs> uh, treaties, um, including um, in uh, human rights issues like the, you know, the the right to water or the right to a clean environment. Um, it's the greening of human rights, and it's clearly happening um, mm -hmm. for different reasons, I guess. Uh, but we'll 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 let uh, the participants also um, uh, try to to imagine <laughs> a little bit why uh, these things are are happening. But please go ahead. I thought you were going to add something, please. No, 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 no. I was, I was not, I was not. But the, you will see that, uh, yes, uh, you were right to speak about part 12. Uh, um, but it's interesting. I'm, I, you know, I've, I've seen some statements where people were saying already when you were nego we were negotiating, the people, negotiators were negotiating the Law of the Sea Convention, they were speaking of climate change. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And th this is something for you, the young generation, uh, who are <laughs> participating to this course, is that uh, we have been learning about all this. We have been learning and it's an evolving knowledge. Uh, and this is why I think we need the legal tools for allowing for the adjustment in light of the new knowledge and uh, and the pressing needs to protect the environment because before it was and it's easily accessible you can look at uh, at the statements but there are a lot of statements scientific statements about the deterioration of the high seas which are it's frightening it's frightening so we need to do something with the tools that we have at hand Yes, and, and, and you've highlighted the importance of science and scientific evidence. I think that's what, uh, um, as when you spoke about anticipation, I think that's also very important because normally, and, and we've discussed this with participants in other models, international law is very uh, reactive, crisis driven, but here because of the science uh, and scientific knowledge, there's a possibility of uh, uh, being proactive and preventing um, uh, because the science is, is, is quite clear. And of course, that doesn't apply to all the areas, but in the environment and climate change area, that is certainly uh, the case. So we have one last question again from Ajema, who's always very active participant um, from Ethiopia, uh, where he says that uh, the government already launched green legacy program, but on the other hand, is still proceeding with timber production or other ways of uses, uh, in particular of the old age forest. Um, how uh, least developing countries meet the protection obligation in light of international conventions? So. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's for you, Laurence. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, it's a challenge for all countries in the world. Okay, it's uh, you have you agree on something, but you do something else <laughs> because and it's this big thing about how to because I think for governments it's very important also to ensure that uh, economic and social needs of the populations are fulfilled. That's very important. But uh, the big requirement of international environmental law is to say this should be done in a sustainable manner. Okay, And so uh, we have now this sort of balance of interest which has to be made. And uh, 
and I do feel that for southern countries, um, there will be a need for financial assistance from the northern countries uh, to help develop other economic activities which are more sustainable. But um, for the time being, because it's the thing is that today the governments have to fulfill their task, but they also have to think about the future and what they should be doing for uh, their countries. We know that the impacts on climate change are going to be more and more dramatic. And uh, so it's a big challenge. And I don't think that we have yet conciliated these two challenges. We have the discourse on environmental protection. We also have this discourse on development. And we're trying to make bridges, establish bridges between the two. And so I think that brings us uh, to the end. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to the participants for having attended uh, this uh, special guest lecture um, outside of the normal time. And we uh, really appreciate that. And thank you for uh, all the questions. And, and then in particular to you, Laurence, a warm thanks from uh, Nilofer, who wasn't able to be present today, but she sends our best regards. And on behalf of all the participants and the CILE Academy, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and sharing uh, with us your uh, very interesting um, uh, presentation on um, uh, international environmental law over time on in time, uh, which is really, I think, one of the key issues that is also interesting uh, of interest for the younger generation, as you mentioned. And, and, and I see and, and I appreciate all the uh, very nice uh, comments that are popping up in the yeah. chat. Uh, Thank so, you. Please. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And, and thank you for all the thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. And um, for the participants, don't forget to tune in tomorrow. And I'll see you again uh, also uh, next week uh, with our uh, guest uh, speaker. And, um, and next week it will be indeed climate change law, which has a lot of connections with international environmental law. Uh, thank you and take care. Have a, a rest of a um, good day or a good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you again, again so much, Laurence. A bientôt. A bientôt. Good evening, everyone.